congratulations to the Pacific Institute in 25 years. It's been a credit to Peter's leadership, but to all those on the board and to all of you who support it. And I hope we'll continue to support it. So I'm supposed to get, I know it's hard to get these two talking, but I'm supposed to get them um, talking really about food and water. And I thought maybe a good place to begin would be to ask you, let me begin with you, Peter Glick, and talk about how the two intersect for you. I mean, let's start on a global scale, and then maybe we can come down to the state and even the local um, as we proceed with the conversation. Then we'll engage you and ask you to perhaps bring in questions or comments. I can't ask you to, I suppose I could ask you to tweet, but not to email or go to my website. But um, <laughs> Peter, how do you see these two? I mean, in, in, in terms of in synchronicity and, and or syn synergistically working together. So, th so there are lots of water problems, of course, um, but fundamentally, you can't grow food without water. Uh, Eighty percent, or seventy-five, or eighty percent of the water that humans use goes to grow food worldwide. Now, coincidentally, that's the same number in California. Eighty percent of the water that we use in California goes to grow food, and so there are, even at the most basic level, fundamental connections between how we choose to use water and the water resources of the planet and our ability to feed the planet. Uh, that, that's the simplest, clearest connection, but it, it leads to all sorts of debates about unsustainable use of water, a growing population, how we're going to feed not seven billion, but eight billion or nine billion or 10 billion or wherever we're going, if we're already running up against water constraints and we're already running up against water constraints. Let me follow through on that because uh, yeah. you know, I did want to ask you, in, in part ask you about how they work together, about how you envision sustainability, especially with the population exploding and proliferating. And uh, you may remember a scientist and ecologist named Garrett Hardin, one of my first interviews, um, who always talked about carrying capacity. And carrying capacity is a real concept. I mean, can we, you spoke very, with, with a great deal of hope about social policy and political policy actually allowing for sustainability. And I was cheered recently when I interviewed uh, Dean Kamen because he's, I don't know how many of you are familiar with him, but providing water purification really in sub-Saharan Africa and all over the world uh, through Coca-Cola, which is pretty remarkable and ingenious in many respects. But let's talk about sustainability with respect to water and what you envision. How optimistic are you? And if you are optimistic, why are you optimistic? Well, I am an optimist in general. Um, in the long run, I'm an optimist. In the long run, I'm convinced we're gonna solve all of these problems. I do think there's a, getting from where we are now to those solutions is the challenge, figuring out the right path and then moving along it fast enough. But um, I'm optimistic in part because today, in theory, we grow enough food for everybody. Now in practice, it's badly distributed, there's a huge amount of waste, that, that's a problem. And we also know that today we could grow a lot more food with a lot fewer resources, with less water, less chemicals. We, we could do a lot more with what we're already doing. And so it's that leeway, if you will, that gives me optimism that, that we can move toward more sustainable use, we can cut chemical use, we can cut water use, and still grow more food for more people. We could also, we did a whole program on the stop wasting so much food, Michael Pollan. I mean, well, it's staggering how much it. we it's, waste. It's, yeah. it's somewhere, I mean, nobody knows exactly what it is, but it's somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of the, the food we're growing is wasted either on the farm, through processing, or in your refrigerator. Um, that's a Both tremendous. You left it on your plate tonight. That's right, that's right. And so that's a big issue. But what Peter says is true. I mean, we're growing, I've seen different estimates, but one I, was, I, I saw today was we're growing 4,600 calories per person um, per day of food, of some kind of food. Um, that's twice as much as uh, the people alive today need if they were eating it directly. The, the problem is they're not eating it directly. A lot of it gets passed through animals. Uh, and you lose an, a huge number of those calories by eating meat. Um, and uh, you know, it takes 10 calories of, of grain to produce one calorie of beef. That's the worst case. But pork's a little better, chicken's a little better than that. Um, so uh, you know, if we're growing 4,600 calories per person per day, we can feed the 10 billion if we divide the pie differently. Nobody wants to talk about how we divide the pie. They want to talk about increasing production. Um, 
And on, on water, there, there are, I mean, we're, we're just very sloppy with how we use water in agriculture because we're not pricing it. Um, I think something like, we were talking about this recently, 25% of the, the agricultural water in California grows, uh, goes to growing alfalfa, which is a low value crop fed to cattle producing milk in the desert, which is not where you should be producing milk. I mean, that's a crazy industry for, for California to be number one in as we are. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to simply to rationalize the system we have would save enormously on, on, uh, on water. Um, so I, I, I tend to agree with Peter that there is a way to do it. We could, we, could, we could feed the world sustainably at a much bigger number, but it would mean discomforting those of us in the affluent West in terms of our diet, uh, less meat, for example, um, and less waste. Uh, more leftovers, um, and uh, so much has to change in, in the way we live our lives and then in the way we organize our, our, uh, our policies to distribute our resources. It almost necessitates a, a cultural change, really, doesn't it, mm -hmm. what you're talking about? I mean, because we've certainly come into a greater, higher consciousness. You've helped a great deal. Both of you have helped a great deal, making us aware. Singing about Jeremy Rifkin's book about meat, which really opened a lot of eyes, and, yeah. you know, and continue uh, to get much more awareness about these things without necessarily finding the viable social or political will and the social policies. So culture, where do we get to culture? Well, I mean, you have to deal with economics first. There's a lot of money in going down the path we're on. Um, you know, the sustainability is, is, is you know, it's, it's been harder to justify on the balance sheet. Um, uh, so many of, I mean, uh, someone who just looks at the food system, one of the things that always strikes me is that all our investment, all our research and development goes into the creation of new products, uh, whether it's a pesticide or a GM crop, you know, a seed, um, and it seldom goes into practices or processes, and that's really where the great gains are to be had. Uh, you know, a clever rotation, a new kind of rotation, or adding a couple crops to the conventional corn-soybean rotation in, in the Midwest could have enormous benefit. But nobody works on it because nobody's figured out how to profit from processes. Uh, yeah, not, like there's the, no IP. It's like the pharmaceutical industry. Think of all the things that could be done, yeah. you know, if they weren't aiming for, for profit so much. But I found myself at dinner having a conversation uh, with Eric about, and, and actually uh, sounding a little bit more sanguine than I usually do, saying, we don't know where technology is going to lead us or what technology is going to make available to us or perhaps solve some of these problems that seem insoluble, particularly climate change. Are you both uh, perhaps feeling a bit hopeful on that note or not? Let me, let me draw a distinction between behavioral change and technology change uh, and this issue of culture. Yeah. Um, there's an enormous amount that we can do to do the things we want with fewer resources. That's a, a question of efficiency. And the Institute's done a lot of work in the water area. Uh, we want clean clothes, we want food, we want semiconductors. Those things take water. All of them, we argue, take less water than we're currently spending to do those things. So if you move from flood irrigation to sprinklers, from sprinklers to precision sprinklers, from sprinklers to drip, you can grow the same food or grow even more food with less water and no change in behavior. That, that's not a behavior, it's a behavior perhaps on the part of farmers, but it doesn't require you to change your diet. There's the question of diet and waste and those are behavior and cultural things and are, are much more difficult and maybe we have to do those things also. But there are a lot of gains that can be made with technology and with changes in practices that don't require you to take shorter showers or let your lawns go brown, but lets you do the things you want more efficiently. And I think that distinction between efficiency and culture and behavior is, is an important one. Well, when you went through, and that is an important distinction, when you went through that impressive list of uh, things that have been done through the years with the Pacific Institute, you didn't mention um, the water footprint, and I'd like to find out, actually, I'd like people who aren't familiar with this to find out, because this is opening up a good deal of enlightenment and new possibilities, isn't it? Yeah, so, the, so there's something called the water footprint. It's a, it's a technique for, you probably know the carbon footprint. It's a way of evaluating the water costs of doing the things we want to do. Um, the Pacific Institute just this year released the first comprehensive water footprint for the state of California. 
we grow a tremendous amount of food in California. We export a lot of that food. I would have actually guessed before we did this that we were net exporters of water in the food that we ex produce internally and export. But it turns out we're net importers of water. The state of California imports more water than we export. And we import more water because we're importing meat mm. and we're importing grain and we're exporting lower water using crops, but also we're exporting semiconductors, which, which produce a lot more money with a lot less water. Um, so that, that's, a, that's sort of a little tidbit about footprinting. It's related to, to Michael's point, Michael made this point about meat versus, was it 10? 10 to one. 10, 10 to one for calories of grain versus a calorie of meat. It's 15 or 16 to one for a, a calorie of meat in terms of water requirements versus a calorie of grain. It takes 16 times more water to produce a calorie of meat than a calorie of grain. So Partly because we're feeding all those calories of grain right. to the cows. Yeah. Right. When you start figuring in climate change, you mean, and, and, and changing behavior and all the things that we're talking about are changing culture and policy. I mean, just the amount of transportation that's put in to haul meat or to haul, I mean, through the whole agribusiness uh, industry. Uh, I mean, what it's doing to the climate and what it's doing ecologically. Uh, well, the food system contributes enormously to climate change. It's probably around 30% of the, of the carbon uh, and other greenhouse gases we put into the environment, into the atmosphere, come from food. People don't realize that it's much more than transportation. Um, and it's one of the most important contributors to climate change. What's different about agriculture, though, is that it has the potential not only through these kind of efficiencies that Peter's talking about to reduce that impact, it actually has the potential to, to um, turn back climate change. I mean, I, I, I think that agriculture has more potential for solving the problem than any other economic sector. I and think you're right. I think California could be a real paradigmatic model here. I mean, look at with what can be done in agribusiness in Central California Look what we've done environmentally in this state. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not follow that same path? And, and with AB 32, the, I mean, the, the carbon um, you know, limits that we have, there's a lot of pressure to do that. Um, although not, the pressure should be more on agriculture than it is. Um, they didn't quite know how to deal with uh, agriculture when they were writing AB 32. And they could get everything right with the cars and the heat and the fossil fuel and then look, and then look at dairy in the Central Valley and realize, oops, we lost it all. Um, because there's a lot of, there's a, a huge problem there. But the great, what gives me hope, you, you were asking about hope earlier, is what we're now learning about the potential of, of, of soil to uh, mitigate climate change, to sequester carbon, to reduce water consumption. Um, and there's some amazing work going on right now in California. Um, there is a, uh, I was talking to a, a farmer up in Nicasio who's participating in the, uh, the Marin Carbon Project. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's something that um, some academics at, at Berkeley and elsewhere are involved with. And they've been experimenting with ways to uh, sequester carbon on, on, on rangelands. Um, and uh, what they have found is astonishing. I mean, they, what they're doing is they're, they're spreading uh, like a centimeter of compost over a thousand acres or so of, uh, of, of rangeland to kind of uh, supercharge the microbial action under, underneath the soil. And um, what they have found that if you do that once, you have six, seven, eight years of enhanced microbial action that is uh, sequestering um, tremendous amounts of carbon in a very stable form. Um, so this, this, has, this does many, many things. I mean, it, it's taking carbon out of the atmosphere, which, you know, about a third of the carbon that humans have put into the atmosphere came through management of land or mismanagement of land. It's not all fossil fuel. We've been doing this for a long time. It's deforestation, it's tilling. That's added uh, a huge amount of carbon. So bringing that back in. But also when you increase the carbon in soil, uh, it holds water better. Um, and when we think about farming in a, uh, in, in a time of drought and, and climate instability, the ability of, of, of uh, soils to hold water, whatever water they have, is going to be critical. And this kind of management of soil can do that. 
Um, it's also a nice use of the word sequestration, too. It is. <laughs> Much better than the one we've been hearing. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, so this kind of work, and there's a lot more science to be done, and we need to support it, has enormous potential to, to help us deal with the climate issue. I mean, we're talking about, according to one study, and again, this is still, I wouldn't say this is mainstream science by any means, but one study that I was just reading about today said that um, uh, if you could take 11% of the rangeland um, or the cropland that is that, uh, in, in, in the country, and uh, I'm sorry, in the world, and deal with it uh, by working with the microbiome of the soil um, and uh, basically inoculating it, which compost does, but there are other ways to inoculate it, that you could remove uh, a double-digit percentage of the greenhouse gases we've already contributed to the atmosphere and grow food with less water and use less chemicals. So it sounds very, very sunny, um, but I think it's, it's the best hope we have out there. It's, it's really dealing with the soil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, throw a can of worms into this maybe because that's very hopeful to hear, but we were talking before about GMOs, and you know, I know many scientists who are very keen on the idea that GMOs can feed the world and are going to be needed as the population continues to exponentially increase. I remember talking to Daphne Miller, whom I'm sure you know, a medical doctor who's written a lot about farming and agriculture and medicine, and she said, we don't know about the soil. We don't know what the effect is on the soil. Do you have that same kind of concern? Yeah, I mean, my concerns about GM uh, crops are um, more about the political economy of GM than the, the science of it, which I think we, you know, there's a lot more we need to know. I mean, you know, the idea that GM is going to, genetically modified crops are going to help feed the world is a beautiful idea, but there's no evidence that that's true. Um, the crops that they've developed are designed to and targeted to uh, farmers of corn and soybeans in the United States. Um, Monsanto's not working on solving these important public problems. It'd be wonderful if they were. Again, but that's not, not where the money is. Yeah. There's not enough profit in it. What about uh, corn and somebody mentioned it before, and ethanol, and uh, I mean, in terms of, again, environmental progress forward? Well, corn based ethanol is, is pretty, I mean, pretty well established as a, as a bust environmentally. I mean, it, it takes as much energy to, to make it as you get from it. It doesn't equal that. Yeah. It doesn't equal out, and it, and it puts pressure on the food system. I mean, when we had this food crisis in 2008, where we had, I mean, we weren't aware of it here because we have the money to command whatever food we need, but worldwide there was an enormous spike in grain prices, um, and uh, that led in part to the Arab Spring and, and a lot of political instability all over the world. Um, at the root of that was uh, the fact that there were a couple poor harvests of, of wheat, there was the demand that ethanol mandates from the United States were putting on world grain stocks. And there was um, uh, Wall Street speculation. It became a really cool thing to do, is invest a lot of money in uh, these commodity, der these derivatives, that, uh, because the Clinton administration deregulated these derivatives so that you could uh, profit on, on price swings in grain, um, which left people very, very hungry. So there were a lot of factors that went into that. Um, and, uh, Wall Street speculators were not yeah. necessarily uh, that hungry as a result. But, uh, no, it, it did nothing for their, their appetites except, uh, well. But let me go back to water for a minute with you, Peter, because I'm just thinking as we're talking here about the fact that, talk about the waste of food and, you know, it's colossal, but so is the waste of water. I was down in Southern California recently. I was in Orange County. I couldn't believe all the sprinklers and all the water that was just being wasted. And it was totally unnecessary. Um, and again, it, it, it strikes me that you almost need a kind of quantum shift in terms of consciousness or culture or something, behavior like you were talking about. And this is California. This is, you know, not a red state. This is a state that's very environmental minded. The, the good news in a sense is that uh, there is a growing realization that we're using water inefficiently. Um, we're actually using less water in California today than we used 30 years ago for everything. There's been a lot of effort to cut waste and inefficient use. Um, so that, that's the good news. The bad news is there's still, and maybe this is good news also, there's still an enormous amount of waste that could be cut. We, we could cut withdrawals of water in urban areas of California 30% and not affect at all the things that we all want to do by replacing toilets and washing machines and leaks and the, the, and outdoor lawns. 
uh, and landscaping. And so when you go to Southern California, you see a lot of that inefficient use still, but it's less, it's less inefficient than it used to be. And I guess what, what is going to drive a change is partly pricing. None of us pay enough for water. We all pay less for water than we pay for electricity or your cell phones or your internet or your cable TV. Um, so we, we don't pay enough for water. So you and I have had a discussion about the um, attempt to privatize water and the uh, water being the next petroleum and all that. Yeah, but that doesn't, pricing water doesn't necessarily mean privatizing water. Almost all of our water systems in the, Cal, in the state of California are public, public agencies. City of San Francisco, Ebmont in the East Bay. Um, there are some private water agencies, but even they're monopolies and they're regulated. Um, so proper pricing of water doesn't require privatization. And actually, we've worked on privatization issues at the Institute for a long time and concluded that there's no evidence that private systems are any better run than well-run public systems. So I, I don't think, I'm not arguing for privatization, but I am arguing for smart pricing. And this is true for agriculture. We, we price water even less in, in agriculture. It comes down to pricing for both, really, doesn't it? And, and that's a tool for efficiency. The farmers in the Central Valley who pay more for water than other farmers in the Central Valley are more efficient. They're more likely to be on drip. They're more likely to not be growing alfalfa, but higher valued crops that have higher return because they pay more for water and they see that signal. So that's a tool that I think we don't use enough. It's one tool that I think could help us move toward cutting the lawns that are water, the watering of the sidewalks and that you saw in Southern California. What do you both think about localizing more? I mean, just in general, bring it down to the local level. Well, well water is ultimately, we, we wrote a book called 21st Century U.S. Water Policy. We talked about national water policy, but, but ultimately water is a local issue. Uh, we get our water from local water districts. It would be nice if we managed our water more, a little more locally as in watershed, what, looking at local watersheds. Um, so I'm, I, I wrote about a local water movement years ago, sort of playing on the idea of a local food, food movement. Uh, I wrote a book about bottled water because I, I, I was sort of stunned at how far we move, this is a transportation issue you raised, how far we move bottled water. We move water from Fiji to the East Coast or from France to the West Coast of the US. I mean, so, so the local water issue, and, and we do that when our local water is unbelievably good. Right. And so there is an argument to be made for a lot of different th thinking about local water. Well, Peter said it'd be nice if we managed water more locally. It's nice that we've gotten more into localization of food. I mean, it's really- I, I think there are a lot of benefits to it. Um, there are sometimes hard, some of them are hard to quantify. I mean, sometimes there's a saving in energy. But not always. Um, you know, local farmers can be inefficient in their use of diesel fuel. Um, but uh, the, the benefits are, are more, I think, I mean, I think the food movement is, is in large part about things other than the environmental benefits of local or organic food. I think it's about community. I think it's about um, the pleasure of, of reconnecting with farmers. Uh, I think it's about um, you know, keeping landscapes uh, looking beautiful uh, and, and not having them sprawl. And so these are all, I mean, it's multifunctional, as they say, I mean, supporting local agriculture. And um, uh, I also think there's an enormous educational function goes, goes on when, when urban people get to meet farmers and, and, and have that conversation. Um, and then that, that ends up informing their politics and their behavior. Um, I don't despair of, of behavioral changes, though. I mean, I, I mean, I think we're going to need them, and I think in our own lifetime we've seen them, I and mean, we've seen yeah. them around cigarette smoking, for example. That's a dramatic behavioral change in this country. There's nobody smoking in this room. I don't think you can smoke in this room. I mean, greens. I mean, but um, <laughs> but you know, try. Twenty or thirty years ago, it would be routine, and um, and the same with littering. I mean, you know, we used to throw stuff out of the windows of our car. And, and I think having a lawn is gonna, is gonna be one of those things. Right. There, there will be a huge stigma on it. And I think uh, we're already seeing diet changes. We are, there, there's no question. Shame is are. a great tool for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, no, it's, it, shame is a tool, but education is a tool. The more people know about what their practices and behaviors do to the environment, the more likely they are to do something different, to, to do the right thing. Right. I, I actually, 
I actually believe that also. But I'm reminded of the old uh, Walt Kelly Pogo line, you know, we've seen the enemy and he's us, uh, but there are other enemies out here and other <laughs> adversaries when we're talking about changing policy with both water and food. Who are they? Well, none of these issues are easy. Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think Michael would say that, uh, and I certainly don't. You know, we haven't solved our water problems in California. I, I go to the Middle East and people, people say, you know, if you guys will solve your water problems in California, then maybe we can solve them in the Middle East. And I come home and people in California say, well, have they solved the problems in the Middle East because if they can do it, maybe we can do it here. So, so it's politics, it's economics, it's, it's all of the things that stymie good public policy. So give me a wish. Well, I mean, the, the food, I mean, the food movement, just to answer that question, has, you know, been, I mean, whether this was good politics or not, has been bumping up with these labeling initiatives right against the most powerful parts of the, right. the food industry, and they're losing. Ditto with the efforts to tax soda and junk food, um, which have lost every single battle. So far, the food movement is doing a good job shaking down the industry and getting them to spend a lot of money on advertising agencies. <laughs> But, so, um, so not every battle. The city of Chicago passed a 10 cent a bottle tax on bottled water. The bottling, bottling industry f was very upset, sued the city of Chicago and lost. The, the city of Chicago has the right to impose a, a tax because of the additional burden on the city's infrastructure of that additional waste. That's a great well, this is more and, and of course, Mexico just passed an eight cent uh, or eight peso uh, a tax on a liter of soda, which is a, a big deal. They have a tremendous problem around obesity and huge soda consumption. This may be a metaphor because tomorrow, uh, you both probably saw the story in the New York Times about herbal supplements and uh, how unregulated they are and how there's all kinds of things in there that don't belong in there and they don't have what they claim they have and there's really almost, it's like the Wild West. Uh, and I found myself, the more I read about it, the more I kind of became shocked with just how little regulation or how little there's been anything operating in terms of uh, allowing it not to have that kind of anarchic or, or uh, chaotic quality to it. And yet, when you talk about, when you say Bloomberg talks about, you know, people say this is the nanny state and they come back at them and they hit them hard with it. any kind of regulation, you know, you have, you come up against that kind of adversarial. So. Well, I, I think the Bloomberg case has been really interesting. I mean, the reason he has been such a, uh, you know, such a maniac about soda is that he's, he understands economics. And when he became mayor, uh, someone sat him down and said, here's where you're bleeding money. It's the public hospital system. And he, and he said, well, what about the public hospital system? Well, every new case of type 2 diabetes is costing you $435,000 over the life of that patient that the city has to pay. And he said, how can we reduce type 2 diabetes? Well, reduce soda consumption. And so that's why he's done what he's done. And, uh, and he ran up against the industry, and he ran up against these charges of nanny statism. Um, it seems to me what he was trying to do was, was what we would characterize really as center-right social engineering, um, the nudge. I mean, this is the, you know, the, the failure in, uh, what's his name, argument that, you know, you, you, ch you make small changes in the, in the environment in which we exist and, and drive good, good uh, behavior. And so here he wasn't saying, he wasn't banning soda more than 16 ounces. He was just saying, you know, pause after a 16 ounce soda before you buy the next 16 ounces and get a second cup. Is that the baby baby and the pause that refreshes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it, it's a little bit like the, you know, there was this whole study in Amsterdam and they found in, in, um, in, if you put a little fly in a urinal, that men's aim would improve and they wouldn't have to spend as much money cleaning the, um, the men's rooms. It's the same basic idea, it's a nudge. Um, and for some reason, this is outrageous when the public, uh, a public entity tries to do it. And, um, so were those waterless urinals? I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I can explain it later, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, but we tolerate social engineering by marketers and corporations all the time. Every time you walk down the cereal aisle, you know, the, the sweetest, most colorful cereals are at your kid's eye level, and the oatmeal is down at the bottom where you can't see it. And that kind of social engineering is fine with everybody. Um, so anyway, I tend to think that uh, Mayor Bloomberg got a bum rap on that. I'm going to go to you because I know many of you would like to join this conversation or have questions. Before I do, though, I want to ask both these gentlemen, triage, what would be top? 
uh, maybe even think of it as a pipe dream here in terms of what would be most significant in terms of change if you could implement some policy right now. Let's talk about food first and then we'll go to Peter on water. Well, if, if I were going to do one thing right now that's doable, it would be to ban antibiotics in livestock production uh, or ban antibiotics in feed. I mean, sick animals is different. Um, I think that this is, uh, you know, a, 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 it's so obvious. I mean, we, the, the, the public health argument for doing this has been clear for 20 years. Um, we have a head of the FDA, Margaret Hamburg, who, who said she was going to do this. And when she came in and uh, she said, we're going to treat this issue uh, as if our hair was on fire. Somebody put out the fire on our head. Um, <laughs> and it was a combination of the pharmaceutical industry, I assume, and, and, and the feedlot industry. And, um, but this would, this would achieve a lot. I mean, this would reduce the amount of antibiotic resistant microbes that everyone in our society is dealing with right now. Um, and it would force the feedlot industry to reduce the intensity of the, of the practices there. I had Margaret on the air and asked her, and she said, What'd she, say? she said, I still intend. It's almost like if you ask <laughs> she, Obama she about Guantanamo. I mean, yeah. I still intend, it's still, maybe. It's you know. still the goal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think that that's a winnable battle, and I think it would be a, a significant battle, more, si more significant than labeling GM food, I think. Peter. It's kind of a wish list, but viable, really. OK, so water is tough because it, there's so many issues. Um, I think the biggest problem is our failure to meet basic human needs for water for everyone. There's still seven or 800 million people who don't have a safe water, two and a half billion who don't have sanitation, something we all take for granted. Uh, that's a solvable problem. There's no new technology that's required. The amount of money that's required to meet basic human needs for water, like some of the food examples we, we've just heard, is far below the cost of not providing safe water because women and girls have to walk for hours to get water and they don't go to school. Kids get sick and they die from preventable water-related disease. So there's serious costs of not providing safe water. And I think that's a doable problem. It's a multi-government problem. It's a multi-non-governmental organization problem. There are a lot of people who can address those issues. But that's, that's a top issue. In the was I overly impressed with Dean Kamen? Because yes, you were. Yeah, tell me why. <laughs> so in the United States, <laughs> I'm, not sure I wanna, I'm not sure I want to address that. Um, this is the guy, by the way, who gave us the segue, you know, and has about 500 invent, invention patents. And so. Okay, so, so I don't know how impressed you were with him, but, and, and he's a brilliant guy. Um, but the problem with basic water and sanitation isn't a new invention. We know how to clean water, and his invention doesn't clean water any more, more than lots of other inventions, and it doesn't do it any more cheaply than other inventions. So I, the, the, the safe water and sanitation problem is not a technology problem. It's an institutional problem. It's a commitment of will. It's corrupt governments. It's misallocation of funds. It, it's, the, it's a different kind of a problem. And distribution. Again, yeah. And distribution. Yeah. In, in the U.S., it's not a basic water and sanitation problem. In the U.S., it's issues of efficiency and management. It's uh, figuring out how to deal with now unavoidable consequences of climate change for our water, which, among other things, and food, but water especially, from my point of view. Um, again, I think those problems are solvable, but, but I, I don't think we're taking the right approach. You mentioned the Middle East before, and I couldn't help thinking about the fact that when uh, because I've had Dennis Ross on, a lot of these people who negotiated con between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and there was there were real water fights going on. I mean, you know, behind all the other rhetoric and all of the enmity that existed for going back centuries, perhaps, and and over land and territory were water possessions. So, so we have um, something on on one of our websites called the Water Conflict Chronology. If you like history, uh, it's every known example of conflicts, violent conflict over water going back 5,000 years, and the first ones are in the ancient Middle East, in Mesopotamia. But there are lots of examples of Israel and Jordan, Israel and Lebanon, uh, Israel and everybody, <laughs> but, and Syria and Jordan, and of conflicts over water. Uh, it's a water short area, it's a place where population's growing rapidly, and it's a place where every river is shared by two or more nations. 
let's share some of your questions and comments and just uh, raise your hand and speak up and don't be inhibited. For, for either Michael or Peter or both. Oh, like this is a shy group. <laughs> yeah. Yes. seems, you know, here we're talking about these huge problems that they affect the whole country, and here's an opportunity to make some progress, do something good, and, um, and I, I, I'm sure you're not going to be very optimistic about, about this Congress or any of the last times they've tried to struggle with the Farm Bill. What, what do we take from that? What's the lesson there about this? Well, you know, the Farm Bill is, uh, you know, there's now a House-Senate uh, uh, conference. Uh, it's hard to imagine they're going to resolve these issues because the House seems intent on cutting a huge amount of money from food stamps at a time when that's, you know, I mean, there, no one but the Tea Party can see a good argument for doing that. Um, it would be a disaster for the economy, not to mention the, the people who depend on food stamps. So I don't know that we're going to see a farm bill. Um, and, um, but you know, the, the big problem with the Farm Bill, like most things in politics, the, the, the initial conditions, the, the rules that govern the process determine the outcome. And the rules here are the fact that basically the people who are on the agricultural committees uh, don't represent eaters. They represent a certain kind of farmer. Um, and, and they're from uh, states, you know, that have commodity crops, um, basically. There's a couple Californians on the, on the on the committees. They haven't exerted nearly as much um, uh, pressure as they should on, on, on the Farm Bill. Um, but uh, until we see uh, legislators who represent eaters, which is to say urban legislators, get on those committees, we're not going to see real change. We're going to see new schemes for funneling you know, $20 billion a year to farmers, very few of whom need small these, these resources. A very small number of farmers receive most of the, the subsidies. Uh, and now they're kind of switching from, sub, since subsidies and particularly direct payments are in such bad odor, they're switching to systems of crop insurance, which sounds a lot more neutral. But essentially, they're, we as taxpayers are going to guarantee very, uh, I mean, historically unprecedented uh, corn, and, uh, corn prices um, to farmers. Um, and the way crop insurance is structured now, uh, you are encouraged to plant in places where you can't grow corn, uh, except one out of every five years, like in the northern, uh, northern plains. Uh, so we're, we're underwriting stupid risks. Um, uh, you know, people in areas that don't have reliable rainfall trying to grow things like corn because they know that the taxpayer will pick up the, the bill if they don't. So, I mean, the, the, the system is, is disastrous. But, you know, until people who represent eaters and, and environmentalists and, um, uh, you know, people other than commodity crop farmers are willing to serve on those committees, it's not going to change. It's also a splendid example because we've done a number of programs on it. Uh, I have to agree with Michael about uh, the sense of the immobility of it or, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's a polarized politics again, special interests, uh, and it's something I would be surprised if, if, if actually some kind of compromise were worked out. I mean, it's a, it's a great metaphor for why things don't work in Washington. But this gentleman has the microphone now. I want to base my question on an assumption that there's 225,000 new people at the dinner table every night, births minus deaths. That's a number that I've heard. If you take 225,000 times 365 days, times 16 and a half a year there's a new China population wise. How are we going to address that from both the food and the water issue? You want to go first? Yeah, so um, Ann Ehrlich is on our board. Yeah. Ann Ehrlich is on our board of directors. Um, and she's always wonders why we don't do more on population. Uh, there are two issues. One is I think we have to deal with the populations we get. However many people on the planet, we have to feed them, we have to provide water and sanitation, however many there are. That's an ethical issue. All of the problems that we deal with, I would argue, are more difficult with a bigger population than a smaller population, with a rapidly growing population than a slower growing population. 
And so I, I think we have to work on both problems. Now, interestingly, as an example, if you provide safe water in schools in developing countries, girls stay in school longer. Educated girls have fewer children. Right? There's a water population connection. So solve the water problems, work on the population issue as well, so that population grows more slowly. Uh, I think you have to do both of those things. You have to meet basic human needs for the populations we have, and we have to do what we can to cut the, cut the rate of population growth. I think it's to you, Michael. You want yeah. to know about food, too. And then. So again, the yeah, question I is mean, sustainability. The, the honest right? answer is, you know, I don't know how you feed 10 billion people. I don't think we've figured that out, and I don't think we really know the answer. Um, the question is, uh, you know, must it be, does that require us to use industrial agriculture because it's so productive? Um, and that question of uh, the feed the world question is often used to undermine um, people who support organic or sustainable agriculture because it's not as, it's not as productive. Um, it's thought not to be as productive. Um, I think that that question is, is a very political question. It's a very loaded question, um, and it needs to be examined. Um, how do we feed the world? You know, as Tonto said, what do you mean by we, white man? Um, it's a very imperial question. It's a question asked mostly in the United States, actually, and that's interesting. And, and part of the reason for that is that the, um, the industry has uh, elevated that question. The agro, I mean, agriculture, technology industry, and um, uh, wants us to ask that question because it's the argument that's been used now for 50 years to, per, to persuade farmers that it's in their interest to grow more food than they can sell. Um, it's very hard to convince a farmer to grow, uh, I mean, it's not in their interest to grow so much food. And, and, and surpluses have been the real bane of American agriculture for, for since the Depression. Um, and so how do you persuade them to keep growing food when they probably should grow less? for their own interest to, to, to keep prices high. Feed the world, we'll export it, we'll get rid of it. Um, but our ideology of feeding the world has often made it hard for people in the world to actually eat because we dump these surpluses on other countries and we cripple their agriculture. Whether it's with grain or, uh, you know, we eat a lot of white meat chicken. Uh, we have a lot of thighs and, and drumsticks to get rid of, so we dump them on countries and destroy their ability to grow chicken. We do this in Africa all the time, and uh, we do it in Latin America. So uh, the, the, the question, I mean, there's a real substantive question underneath it, but then there's the, the framing of the question, which I think is very political and is designed to promote um, the export of our agricultural technologies and our food uh, in the re rest of the world. Um, I don't know that we have an option of feeding the world through industrial agriculture. I think it is so capital intensive um, that it's completely inappropriate for many places. And, um, and that the models we're developing in this country of sustainable agriculture, um, whether it's you know, multi-species, polycultural animal agriculture or diversified plant agriculture, may have more to offer the developing world than our highly productive grain agriculture, for example. But it's a question that I'm, uh, you know, I haven't really delved into yet, and, and it's one that I think is very pressing and, and I, I plan to delve into. But I think we shouldn't accept the framing of the question uh, before we begin to try to answer it. We thank you nonetheless for raising so, it. We so I have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Yeah, this is going to have time. to be the last question. Anybody over here? Young lady? Um, my question is about. Uh, uh, cattle and beef, and I've kind of, uh, in terms of the difference between grass-fed versus other, and it seems to me that, especially grasslands in the world, um, you know, you just look like 10,000 years ago, and, you know, where we're sitting now, you know, there was, there was no bay, and it was this, it, it, it was the, it would have dwarfed the Serengeti, you know, there were mammoths, and zebras, and bison, and, and, and herd animals, and ungulates, and so, to me, it seems like, um, Maybe I've just drunk the wrong Kool-Aid, but um, <laughs> that that. We're bringing back the mastodon, by the way, if you haven't read. Uh, oh, good, good. No joke, but but that 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 you know, grass-fed beef can actually um, provide revenue for people as well as 
um, you know, be great for wildlife. And so I guess I'm curious why you're so down on beef. Me? Yeah. Well, I'm not down on all kinds of beef. I mean, that, that, that 10 to 1 ratio I was talking about assumes that you feed beef grain. And beef actually don't do very well on grain. They grow quickly, but they're not very healthy. And if you feed them grain, you have to give them antibiotics. And, and, and why do you distinguish that? So, well, I should distinguish that, except that grass-fed beef represents a fraction, a very small fraction of the beef that we eat in America. I mean, um, but the, 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 the beautiful thing about grass-fed beef is they don't, com it, those animals don't compete with humans for their food because we can't eat grass. We can, if we could digest grass, many of our problems would be solved. <laughs> and maybe we should work on that. Um, that. Maybe that's the biotechnology we need, is, is giving humans rumens. I thought Walt Whitman gave us all uh, <laughs> um, license. But you're right. I mean, you know, this is, a, this is a form of very nutritious food that is grown with a feed source that is not competitive. Um, there are still climate change issues, even with grass-fed beef, because they do produce a lot of methane. Um, but if they're grazed in, a, in a, a proper way, which is to say rotationally and intensively, um, they may sequester enough carbon um, to mitigate the, the methane that they're producing. Um, it, it isn't really clear. But no, I've, I mean, I've been a, a, a strong supporter of, of moving um, cattle off of grain and onto grass. If we're going to eat beef, that's the kind of beef we should eat. And that if we took some of the, the grain land in the Midwest, you know, 20 to 30 percent of all that grain being grown in the Midwest is being fed to cattle, and actually put it back to perennial polycultures, which is to say grass, and fed the animals on that, that would be a tremendous gain um, for the environment. Um, and, uh, and, and there are, you know, there are places in the Midwest where this is beginning to happen. And it's a very encouraging development. Um, so, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a very important distinction. And, uh, uh, and we need to make it, yeah. Well, I'm encouraged that we have these two gentlemen doing the kind of work they're doing. I want to thank you both. Thank you for your attention. And onward Pacific Institute. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Okay.